Thing you Last thing I have, Gerber tool. Oh Multi-tool. I was waiting for you to pull out something that's useful. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going guys? My name is Kevin. I'm so excited to be hosting this week's episode of 4 Minute Film School. Today we're doing a scene, but we're going to be moving lights within that scene. We're going to be going from this to this. Let's get it, guys. Let's get it. So today we're gonna to be covering a few different things. One of them is overhead rigging. How do we get a pretty heavy camera up in the air, looking straight down, and how do we do it safely? That's the number one thing we wanna do because we're gonna be having talent lay underneath that camera. We're also gonna be covering how to rig moving lights. How do we move them? How do we rig them? And how do we pull off taking one light that's cool in temperature and transitioning it to warm light all within one scene? I can't wait to get into this. This has a lot of moving parts. Let's dig in. I think you guys are gonna learn a lot from this. Let's go. So the concept, the story behind our scene today, we're in a bedroom. We have a young lady whose heart is broken. She's filled with anxiety. Maybe she got you know, broken up with the day before or she failed a test or got fired from her job. She's gonna try to sleep. Um, but she's gonna lay down and she's gonna find herself up all night. So what we're gonna do to show passing of time in a short amount of time is take two lights, bring one in for moonlight and slowly fade that out into warm sunlight. So I could have easily chosen a house, a actual house where there is an actual bedroom. But uh, one thing is that, again, I wanted the control. I didn't want any of the sun to kind of peer in in different parts of the day. I also wanted the space outside of the window because we're gonna be creating a window where the sun's gonna be coming through to be able to set up some of the lights that we are going to be rigging today, which we will be getting into. Um, and honestly, why make it easy and have a house? Let's get, let's build it from the ground up. Let's build it from scratch. Let's make it a little hard. You can easily take some of the steps I'm gonna be doing today into your own production and probably make it a lot easier, but let's have some fun and build it from the ground up. All right, Kevin, this is your first time on Four Minute Film School. You're hosting. I'm so nervous, I'm gonna throw up. <laughs> well, the people have to know if they can trust you, right? So I wanna ask you, what's inside your ditty bag? Oh man, my ditty bag, okay. Let's get started here. First and probably most important, La Croix. La Croix. So you say La Croix and not La Croix. Well, it depends on if I'm working with Aperture, it's La Croix, because there's, <laughs> we're, we've got Bouge. We got the Bouge. Any other shoe, it's La Croix. I always bring my gels with me. Dude. These are just your traditional Lee gels. They're organized into CTO and CTB with all the strengths. The organization. Big office. label guy, big label guy. All right, next up I have the Aperture MC. Yeah. Great thing to have in your tool belt. I use it for onset stuff. Um, I also use it for when we're in the dark. Super great light to have around. Of course, I got a little film camera. The AE1, I got you know. the Nikon. Okay, okay. I love, I love shooting film. It's, it's pretty yes. great to have on set just to get little shots here and there. Have my little passport card, mm -hmm. color card. Color checker. Got tape. Now, mind you, this is nowhere near Valentina's tape collection. Yes. All right, Valentina, <laughs> I got tape too. What's up? All right, so what's the last thing that you have? The last thing I have, when all else fails, what would Deacons do? Probably not oh anything you've God. seen thus far, but what would he do if all else fails? Guys, he's a certified city boy. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are shooting on the red Komodo, and one of the reasons why I chose the red Komodo to shoot on was because we're gonna be doing some overhead rigging. And the lighter I can get the camera package, the safer it is for talent and everyone on set. And just the easier it is, the less rigging you need to actually rig it up on top. So as far as glass goes, I chose my Leica R's. I have a vintage set, about 40 years old, and I love these because much like the body, they're, they're very compact and very small. Again, for that overhead rigging, we need to be as light as possible. They have an organic aesthetic to them. Um, they're kind of a departure from the clean look. I kind of want more of a vintagey character, a little bit of dirtiness to the, to the image. So I'm really excited to be shooting on these as well. And of course, you guys saw my What Would Deacons Do patch. I keep it on my camera at all times where I'm looking all the time. So every time I'm kind of unsure or even when I'm composing a shot, I think about my boy Deacons. 
So part of the reason I wanted to location scout was to find out where my natural light is coming in. I really wanted to make sure that the sun and the natural light wasn't contaminating my scene as we're creating all of our own artificial light. I estimate that the windows were about 10 by 10 each. So what I did was I grabbed two 12 by 12 neg fills and I just blocked them off. We also used some visqueen to block some of the other windows off. And as you can see, we've got no sun coming in. We're at full control of lighting, and it's all up to me to be able to create that natural sunlight. So one of the most important parts of this production and the success of this production is the production design. We're building a bedroom in a studio, and there's so many little parts that go into that, uh, but I think we're doing a great job. My homie Day over here is hooking it up with a bedroom in a studio. The good thing about this is we don't have to build out an entire bedroom. When I was designing the storyboards and picking out my shots, I had one that's looking directly into the corner and then one that's looking straight down. So we really only have to build out what's in frame and not worry about everything behind us. To simplify this, we're using the studio wall as the wall behind the bed. So the other wall is gonna just be a goalpost and we're gonna hang some drapery from the top of the goalpost just to sell that there's a window back there. Obviously, you and I know that there's not a window back there. There's a window back there. So when it comes to production design, you just gotta make it work. And you gotta get creative, you gotta try to make things happen that look good on frame. And as you can see, we kinda did that. For the backboard, we're using an existing couch. On top of that couch, we have a blow-up mattress that's sitting on a futon. You gotta stay creative. If it looks like a bed, it'll sell for a bed. So as you can see, we have Dylan setting up some Venetian blinds. Obviously, it's a window. We want to sell that it's a window. Obviously, we're in a studio, so anything we can do to make this look like a window, we're going to do. The other reason I'm doing it is I want to create some texture and some patterns within the shadows. It's going to fall onto the, the wall, it's going to fall onto the bed, and it's going to fall onto our actor. And when you see the shadow of Venetian blinds, your mind will automatically think that's coming from a window. Another important reason I brought these blinds in is to hide the lights. I don't want the camera seeing the lights from our secondary angle. And as you can see, our lights are moving in front of that window, right into frame, and I wanna make sure that the camera does not see. So if I adjust these blinds downward, it's gonna hide those lights from being in frame. So this scene is mostly gonna be low key. It's nighttime after all, and low key means it's just darker. Overall, generally a darker scene. So one of the lights I'm setting up is a fill light. Um, and the, the way I'm doing that is using a Nova. I've got that set up low to the ground on what's called a turtle stand. That is bouncing up into two floppies that are side by side. The ultra bounce is bouncing through a half grid, an eight by eight half grid. And the reason we set up book lights is because we don't want to necessarily see that there is a light source lighting up the scene. We just want a general ambient sourceless light that lifts up levels. All right, as you can see, we just got our doorway dolly set up on a track. And usually these doorway dollies are used for very dynamic camera movements that are really smooth, but I'm repurposing this and I'm gonna put lights on there. And that's how we're gonna get the movement of our lights within our scene. So our gag light is finished. Our lights that are gonna be moving are set up, they're ready to go. All we need to do is add some gels, but I kind of wanted to bring you into what we've done with this. So what I love so much about these Matthews doorway dollies is They've got junior adapters built into the base, which is awesome because I can take the turtle base off of my C-stands and just bring the C-stand directly into the junior adapter. And that gives me a mounting point for my light. So this light is going to be our moonlight. I'm gonna gel it with some CTB to give us that cool kind of moonlight. So I've rigged another 300D Mark II onto the handle of the doorway dolly. I'm using a Cardellini to mount that. And as opposed to our moonlight, I'm gonna put CTO on this. That will give it a warm kind of sun look and that's gonna be our sun. So one of the tricky parts to this lighting gag is we're gonna have to figure out how to fade the moonlight and bring up the sunlight in sync. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna connect one of the 300Ds to Citus Link and then the other 300D to a different Citus Link app. And I'm gonna have a couple crew fade one in as the other one fades it out. We're gonna have to time it, it's gonna be fun. I love this sort of stuff because production is all about learning the rules and being able to break them. We're using a doorway dolly, not for a camera, we're using it for lights. It's gonna be something that I don't usually do, but I think it's gonna be really cool. We'll see what it looks like. How far in do you go? Right above her face. Okay. Okay. One of the things you wanna do, especially when you're handing over gear, people are handing lenses, expensive glass, expensive cameras, is to be super safe. And when you're handing over gear from one person to the other, you wanna be communicating when they're letting go and when I'm grabbing it. So, Lee, 
Got it? Simple as that. You don't want to guess that the person receiving has got a grip on it. You want to make sure they're communicating always to make sure that I actually have it. Because if I drop this thing, Deacons wouldn't do that. Deacons wouldn't do that. Oh, oh yeah. It's like side load. All right, lock. Locking. Hands. Hands. The baby pins can't hold them more. Oh the, yeah, good, good idea. Copy. Since we're rigging a heavier camera load above talent and it's gonna be looking straight down, we have talent underneath. Safety is the name of the game. Before anything else, we want everyone on the crew to be safe. So one of the ways we're doing that is we're connecting a safety chain from the camera onto the goalpost. So Lee has connected the safety chain, which is around the head. That's connected to the goalpost. If this falls down, this safety is gonna keep it from falling on our talent. So another level of safety, we wanna ensure this camera doesn't fall. For some reason, if this fails, We've got a cardellini connected to a gobo arm, and the gobo arm is going all the way to the cage of the camera where a baby pin is connected. So if for any reason this first level of safety fails, the second level of safety will protect our talent from the camera being dropped on our head. Nobody wants that, and Deacons wouldn't want that either. So we've got our initial framing up, and I'm really liking where we are so far. One of the things though that I noticed is one of the goalpost stands is clear in frame. It's going right across her face. Um, where she would be laying, and you can kind of tell it's a stand. So what I'm doing is I'm flying in a plant in there, some foliage to kind of blend in those shadows, just so it kind of hides that stand, a clear stand in the shadows. A few more, keep, keep coming, continue. We're gonna yeah. keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Is that it right there? Right, right there. there, right there. It's such a sliver. So what we're doing is we're kind of marking the A spot and the B spot to where the light is gonna move that's on the track. And we ended on our B spot right here. This is where the track is gonna end. And the reason I chose this track was because there's a sliver of light going right across her eyes. And what that creates is an eye light, a catch light right in her eye, basically mimicking the sun and it just brings her to life. Since we're working with two different color tones, we're working with cool moonlight and warm sunlight, I wanted the camera to kind of sit right in the middle. So I set my camera to 4,500 Kelvin. And that will allow the moonlight to be cool. And when we transition to the sunlight, it'll be more warm. All right, guys, settle in. This is our first take. Pictures up, quiet on set. Camera speeding. Stand by. In three, two, one, action. Okay, cool, we just finished our first shot of the day and that shot was actually later on in our scene. Um, now we're gonna film the first scene. Um, we're kind of shooting out of order, but that's okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little bit more to our scene. We're more of a side profile light looking into the corner. I wanna add a practical. I'm gonna use a B7C into a floor lamp that we have set up. I wanna add some more depth and one of the ways we can do that is using color contrast. The beginning of our scene starts with moonlight, which is cooler. Change this to maybe a 3200 Kelvin just to keep it warm. Moonlight doesn't necessarily overtake any sort of interior lights or practical lights. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna dim down the moonlight a little bit. I don't wanna kill the moonlight. I still want the moonlight to be shown on the Venetian blinds. I want there to be some cool light kind of edging out the Venetian blinds in the border of the window. But for the most part, the practical should be more of the primary light source in the room. Again, we're trying to make it as natural as possible and sell it to the audience. So we just turned on the hazer and I love haze. If you know me, I, I haze almost everything. And the reason why is to just create more depth within the image, more visual interest. There's a few different ways you can do that. You can, you know, shoot into the corner. That's giving us depth. You can add foreground elements and you can add haze. And what haze does is it gives you what's called volumetric lighting. It gives you atmosphere. And what it also allows you to do is see strong light sources and see the directionality of what light's doing. In our case, when the sun comes up, I wanna kinda of be able to see the sun rays blast through that window and shine on our character. All right, cool, I like the way this looks. Let's go for it, guys.
And that's a wrap! All right, guys, that's a wrap. I had so much fun. I'm glad you guys got to join me and the rest of the Aperture team. Today we looked at camera rigging vertically for a top down. We looked at moving lights within a scene. And then we also looked at how to change temperatures from cool to warm. So I'm curious, I wanna know if you've ever seen lights moving within a scene and how you would create that. Comment down below. We're gonna choose one person to win an Aperture MC light. Good luck. See you guys later. Oh, 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 oh,